Let's begin with a word of prayer. And I know we have several in our church that are still struggling with COVID, and I'm sure we all know people who are. So we need to make sure of that. And for Manbeck people, you'll get your handout for this week on Sunday. Uh, you can review it and find out what we missed uh, on that. Let's pray. Lord, thank you again for your word, your willingness to reveal yourself and your will to us through it. As we study it, help us to approach it not merely as something to look at, but as something to apply in our lives day by day. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Hey, Andy, welcome on. Hi, uh, thanks. Sorry, sorry we're late. <laughs> Mute him. Oh. We're working on it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Man, Ardell is coming on, it looks like. Anyway, because last week was one of those weeks, uh, we really didn't get at the Council of Jerusalem. Uh, we decided at least this week we would review a little bit of it, introduce it, then look at the council uh, in more detail. And by way of review, last week we looked at Galatians chapter 2, and we said that is probably the background to the problem they had and to the council in Jerusalem. Uh, Galatians 2, Paul details an occasion when he had to confront Peter uh, over some of his beliefs, and particularly in terms of how he approached Gentiles. And uh, at that point, uh, Peter was in Antioch, and that's where all of this was taking place. Early on, as Gentiles became Christians, uh, they were accepted as full Christians. And, uh, but then as time went on, uh, things got a little more complicated. And some Messianic Jews, whose background was that of the Pharisees, uh, came to Antioch and said, you know what, uh, you really just can't make Jesus your Messiah without also accepting all of the teachings of Judaism, including circumcision and all of the dietary laws and regulations. It appears that they, at least for a period of time, Peter and Barnabas bought into that and uh, stopped going to visit Gentile homes. Uh, the reasoning being that uh, if I go to a Gentile home, uh, they're obviously going to feed me. And I don't know if that food is going to be kosher or if it's been prepared in a kosher way. So rather than stumble that way, we won't go. Uh, Paul confronted them, disagreed, challenged them. And uh, as a result of that, uh, Paul, Peter and Barnabas both agreed with Paul, and as far as we can tell, went back to visiting with uh, the Jewish Christians, the Gentile Christians there in Antioch. Then we get to uh, Acts chapter 15, and if you have your Bibles, you'll want to follow along with that. The first five verses of, of that chapter kind of give us the setting for it all. And again, it's material we've been kind of looking at and early on when the church began, it was almost exclusively Jews who accepted Jesus as their Messiah. It began to spread then to other areas, to Gentile areas. And again, early on, most of the converts were those who were close to Judaism, who were perhaps interested, hadn't made the commitment to become a Jew, but were following the one God of Judaism. And uh, when they made a commitment, uh, they were not troubled at all with following at least some of the Jewish regulations, particularly uh, the dietary rules and so forth. Then Christianity spread even further into areas that were totally Gentile. Uh, the first of those would have been Cornelius. And uh, these Gentiles accepted Jesus, but they weren't really connected enough to Judaism to follow any of those regulations. And uh, then when that group of uh, Judaizers 
uh, came along, uh, Pharisee, Messianic Pharisees came down and questioned their ability to go straight from Gentile to Christian without passing through uh, Judaism, a lot of questions arose. For Paul and Barnabas, uh, the issue was a very serious one. It involved not simply relating how a Gentile is going to relate to Jewish culture, such as uh, dietary laws and so forth, but it involved the very heart of the salvation message. Paul was totally committed to salvation by grace through faith alone, nothing else. And uh, his feeling was, and he was right on it, that if a Gentile had to follow Jewish laws, then salvation became salvation by faith plus adherence to those Jewish laws. And uh, they couldn't agree on it because there were those strong Christians uh, who said, no, that's not right. You've got to go through it. So what they did was they called a, a council, a committee meeting of the leadership of the church uh, in Jerusalem. And uh, the rest of uh, Acts 15 kind of details that. In, in verses 6 to 11, we have a record of what Peter had to say. Now, Luke does not give us the kind of information that a modern historian would want to know. Uh, today, we want to know, well, what did Thomas say? How about Harry? What about Roger? You know, what did they say? What were their views? Luke simply records the information from those who spoke and whose decision was part of the final uh, conclusion that they came to, the majority decision. Uh, Peter spoke first and uh, recorded uh, what he had to say. Luke has a very short summary of it, but uh, Peter had two primary reports uh, or points to his speech. One was he talked about his experience with Gentile converts, including or especially uh, Cornelius, who not only made a commitment but received the Holy Spirit. As far as the church was concerned, if you received the Holy Spirit, then obviously you were accepted by God. And by the way, just to put this in a kind of a time frame, that uh, incident with Cornelius was roughly 10 years uh, before the council in Jerusalem. So the church is moving forward. A lot of things are happening. And Peter's second question or objection to following the laws is a rather interesting one. He picked up on what Paul later developed in Romans, and that is that while Judaism had all of these laws and rules and so forth. The reality is most Jews couldn't keep them. That's why they had a king continually go back to the sacrifices. It was simply an oppressive kind of a, a system as far as they were concerned. And uh, the, Paul would call the law a curse. And uh, that's basically what Peter was saying at this point. Peter's point was, why do you want to now place on Gentiles that which we have struggled with all of our lives, uh, how we keep them and, and relate to them and so forth? And so his conclusion in verse 14 was that uh, redemption is by grace alone, not coming through the rules of Judaism. And then in Acts 15, 12, uh, Luke simply records that Paul and Barnabas spoke. He didn't tell us anything about what they said. Luke simply summarizes it uh, by saying they, they reported on what had happened during their first missionary journey and how God had verified the commitments that they had made to Gentiles with the miracles that took place and so forth. One little interesting factor about that verse is that it puts Barnabas first in the list of people, uh, the two of it's Barnabas and Paul, meaning at that point, uh, Barnabas was still more important as far as the team goes than Paul was.
it probably wouldn't be that for long, but at this point, uh, Barnabas and Paul are, have come down from, from Antioch to meet with all of these leaders of the, the Christian church there in Jerusalem. And the, the number one leader of the church in Jerusalem at this point uh, seems to be James. Now, this is not James the disciple. If you remember, we talked about him a couple of weeks ago. He had been, he had been captured and executed. Um, this is James, uh, the brother of Jesus. Um, and this is the James that also a little bit later is going to write the book of James. Um, and so that's who this James is. What I find interesting about uh, James is that uh, when... It seems that when Jesus was alive um, before his crucifixion, James was not a believer, which if you think about it very long, I guess kind of makes sense. If my brother told me he was the Messiah, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't believe it either. But, but uh, then Jesus was crucified and, and resurrected. 1 Corinthians 15, 7 tells us that, that Jesus appeared to James. So I guess, I guess if my brother rose from the dead, I did, well, I guess you are the Messiah. <laughs> That's kind of a kind of a giveaway there. So and James, James, because of his his knowledge of who Jesus really was and his his authority in um, in, in in the Christian church, he has become kind of the the head of the entire Christian church, uh, particularly the, the church in Jerusalem. Um, and so when the council of Jerusalem meets, when all these leaders meet, it, it's, it's James that is kind of the, the, the facilitator for the, the meeting. Uh, in the early church, they actually uh, gave James a title. You know, titles are real important. Herod the Great, um, you know, uh, Peter the Rock and things like that. Well, they, they called James, James the Just, uh, because of his uh, righteous reputation. And so he was a good guy. Um, and he had become kind of the leader of the Jerusalem church and, and the moderator of this group. Um, <clears throat> there's actually a, a story uh, about James when he died um, the, uh, whether it's uh, apocryphal or not, we're not sure, but uh, it's a tradition anyways that says uh, when James died, his knees were as calloused as those of a camel from the time he spent on his knees in prayer. Uh, I think that's, that's, that's pretty good. So, um, and, and a side note on that also, I, I think for something else that's very interesting about James is James wrote the book of James. And um, when you are in seminary and you take uh, biblical Greek, a lot of times you spend the first bunch of your Greek learning in the book of James because James wrote in really, really good Greek. Um, some of the other Greek in the New Testament is kind of, eh, you know, they use slang and, and things like that. But, but James is a very pure kind of, of Greek. And um, some have questioned, some scholars are starting to question and wonder, how did James know such good Greek uh, he must have gone to school. Well, if James, who was a younger son, a younger brother of Jesus, had gone to a really good school, maybe Jesus went to a, a good school. We're kind of rethinking some of the, uh, maybe the, rethinking the education of, of Jesus. You know, we always think of Joseph as, as a poor carpenter. And, you know, well, maybe, just maybe, they had a little bit of money and they had to, the opportunity to send uh, the, the boys to a, to a quality school. The Bible says Jesus grew in wisdom and stature in favor with God and man. And it's quite possible that, that Jesus, I mean, we, we know who Jesus was, but Jesus might have been, been a little bit smarter than some people, uh, some people nowadays take him for. Uh, the testimony of James is, is really interesting. 
in that um, some of those who were demanding that Gentiles become Jews first before they could become Christians were actually claiming that James supported them. Um, if he was James the just, a very righteous man, a very Jewish man, then uh, they they believed that uh, uh, they believed that he would be in favor of that. Uh, however, at the council, after hearing everything, um, when James got up to speak, it was very obvious that he did not indeed believe that. Um, and and he was more on the side of of um, Barnabas and Paul and and Peter. Uh, a couple notes on James's speech. Um, <clears throat> it's it's interesting because um, it's not easily apparent in English, but James uses some Old Testament um, uh, terminology. To talk about the Gentiles. In, in Acts uh, 15, uh, 14, um, he, he talks about the Gentiles uh, by taking the Gentiles a people for himself. And, and that's, that's terminology that the Old Testament uses uh, to, and it generally talks about the Jewish people being called by God. And James here says, well, the Christians were, are called by God. It's, it's, the, same, it's the same terminology um, to, to indicate that, that Christians, we as Christians, are, are set apart as, as God's chosen people. And uh, I don't think anyone who was present at the council would have missed that connection. We look at it today, and we don't, we don't quite understand that connection. But if you, if you really dig in, you find out that... Um, he's, he's tying Christianity, the, the, the chosen people, um, he's tying them together, that, that Christianity, that we as Christians are God's chosen people. It's not just reserved for the Jewish people anymore. There is an interesting passage in Acts chapter 15 and verse 16, uh, sorry, 16 and 17 uh, and 18, where James uh, actually quotes from the Old Testament, uh, from, from the book of Amos. And um, I, I, always, I always think that's interesting that uh, whenever, whenever these guys get into arguments about theology and the, 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 place they, the places they go to, they first go to the Old Testament and they, then, or, or they go to the Old Testament and they go to Jesus' words. And, and those are the things that... That should be the basis of our discussion. You know, the Bible should always be the, the basis of our faith. And, and James, you know, they, they talk about what Jesus said, and they talk about what does the Old, Old Testament say. say. This particular quote um, out of the book of Amos is, is actually interesting. Um, James quotes out of a translation of the Bible that's called the Septuagint. And we, I think we've mentioned that before. Uh, the Septuagint was actually a Greek translation of the Old, the Hebrew Old Testament, uh, written probably in Egypt, some about 200, uh, 200 to 100 BC. So uh, about 150 to 200 years before this. Um, and, uh, and, and James does take a little bit of liberty in quoting it, and, and, but he applies it in a way that's, that's different from how the Jews uh, understood it in his days. Um, the, the passage in Amos, uh, again, talks about um, God coming and restoring the house of David and, and the Gentiles who bear my name, say the Lord, who does these things? That have been known for ages, and so he he calls he he looks at the Gentiles and says even Gentiles are are calling on God, and it's it's in the Old Testament, um, and so and and he and James takes that and points out really looks at this prophecy in Amos and says basically that the heart of the passage in Amos that he's quoting from is that God has a plan for the Gentiles. And, and James says that plan is to redeem the Gentiles. Without them, 
having to come to the Messiah through Judaism, that they can go straight to, we can go straight to God without having to become Jewish first. Acts chapter 15, starting in verse 19, then James says, okay, we've heard all the discussions. We don't know how long they, they argued, probably multiple days and multiple sessions, and I'm sure they kept accurate minutes and all that other stuff. Um, but uh, finally, they come to a decision, and uh, James draws it to a conclusion, starting in verse 19. And there are really two parts to the decision in Jane, in, uh, in Acts chapter 15. Uh, according to verse 19, the decision was that salvation is by faith alone, and that anyone can come directly to God through Jesus without coming through Judaism. And we don't need to accept um, Jesus plus the Jewish laws. Um, this did not imply that there aren't any standards that we have to follow or, or, or in some way the moral law that God has set forth, uh, forth it, it was abolished. But keeping the various dietary laws and, and those kinds of laws are not necessary um, for salvation which I think is fantastic because I love bacon. And so I'm glad, I'm glad we're, we're able to enjoy that. Um, I find it also very interesting that when James writes his letter, the book of James, if you ever read that passage, uh, that, the book, um, it's very strong in, in doing works. Um, he wrote uh, that, uh, you know, faith without works is dead and, and, and that, actually, I believe it was Martin Luther, the German theologian reformer, wanted the book of James taken out of the Bible because he was, he was like, no, not works, not works. But, but, but James understood that we, we follow laws, the, the God's laws, not because um, they're required for salvation, but they're an expression of a love. It's a love response. Um, to, to being saved. such God has given us such a great salvation that we respond in love with, with doing things. Um, and James notes in verse 21 that uh, many, uh, many of the Gentile converts who had converted to Judaism uh, were still meeting in the synagogue and then had become Christians, were still meeting in the synagogue and, and they'd heard the laws of Moses and so they're kind of familiar with them. Verse 20 um, gives um, uh, that they, they decide to send a letter um, to, to the various churches explaining this, and they want uh, a couple of things to be understood, and uh, they this is what it says in verse 20. I know mom usually reads these, but this one I gotta read. Sorry, Mom. I'm not going to unmute you just so you can read it. Uh, it says in, in verse 19 and 20, It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, verse 20, instead we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. Um, and I think those, that, those two verses sum up um, the, the important parts of the discussion. Uh, people are free to come to God through Jesus without going through, through, uh, through Judaism. And, and that's basically both what Peter and Paul had mentioned um, and, and James brought forth in, in the previous couple of verses. However, that other verse, verse 20, where it gives that list of things that we should be careful of, a lot of scholars have tried to figure out what is going on with that. Um, there are, you know, I guess when you look at it, you know, abstain from food polluted by idols, meat of strangled animals, blood, those, are, those do seem to be dietary laws from the Old Testament. Um, but most, I think most scholars look at that and say, you know, we're, they're not, he's not saying follow the laws because it gains you salvation. What he's saying is when you are meeting with Jewish 
worshipers, when Gentiles and Jews get together, be concerned about each other. Don't bring offense to each other. Jewish culture, Jewish thought was, you know, you, the food had to be kosher. You couldn't eat strangled food because the uh, meat that had been strangled uh, because the, the blood hadn't been, been taken care of properly. Um, food that's offered to idols was something that was forbidden in Jewish culture. And so, and so um, James and, and the others want to, want to let the, the Gentile Christians know, listen, there is a cultural issue going on here. And, and let's, let's, let's give and take and don't, don't do things that, that will bring offense to, um, <clears throat> to, to the Jewish leaders. Um, that one, there, there is one issue that seems kind of out of place in verse 20. And in the middle of the discussion of all these dietary regulations, um, James adds in there from sexual immorality. And that seems to be, uh, it might be a reference. We're not sure, exactly sure what it means. I mean, we know what sexual immorality means, but what, what does it mean in this particular context? Um, and it probably is talking about um, uh, mixed marriages. Um, in Jewish culture, the, the Jewish people were, were commanded by God not to marry outside of the Jewish faith. And so this might be a, a discussion about continuing that don't marry outside of the Christian faith. If you're, if your spouse, if you're, if your bride to be is not a Christian, then uh, don't, don't, don't do those kinds of marriages that don't marry outside the Christian community. Um, that's, that's a possibility. Uh, it could also have a possibility that it, just talking about sexual immorality, we, we do know that uh, Roman culture was rife with sexual immorality of all kinds. And if people are coming in from the, the Roman culture, we, they want to make sure that uh, um, we, keep, we keep pure in the things that, that God wants uh, us to do. Lots of studies have been over, done over the years to tie these, very, these four items, uh, uh, food polluted by idols, sexual immorality, um, meat of strangled animals and blood have been tying, tying them into specific areas of Jewish laws and how that relates to us today. Uh, but I, I think it seems probably best that these things were, were issues that dealt with fellowship between Gentiles and Jewish people. And, and we, we just need to, I, I think the, the, behind behind the actual regulation the, the thought behind it is is look out for each other don't don't cause offense to each other and if we do that we'll we'll get along and we'll further the the gospel message certainly unity in the church was a big issue it always is with it by the way dan brought up the issue uh, i wasn't going to bring it up of liking bacon <laughs> Definitely like bacon. Andy, I got a question for you. As a doctor, the latest trend, the latest information from medicine is the uh, heart transplant with a pig's heart. <laughs> um, can that happen for a Jew? <laughs> or, or or a Muslim? I don't or know a Muslim? They, or I don't know if they'll I don't know if they'll transplant a pig's heart into a Jewish guy. I don't think so. Just thought I'd ask. Just an idea. One of those things that uh, you wonder about when yeah. you have nothing else to do. <laughs> anyway, we pick up the the council in Jerusalem, and a, a delegation in in verse twenty two was chosen, and uh, they decided to send a letter and send two individuals along with that letter uh, to communicate the decision. Uh, remember, two witnesses were required under Jewish law to confirm an incident. So perhaps they were saying, look, uh, the Gentiles will accept one coming with the letter, but maybe we need to have two just uh, to be sure everybody understands it. And one of the ones chosen was Judas called Basabas, uh, which is actually the Aramaic for the son of the Sabbath, and uh, may imply that he was born on the Sabbath. 
from what is recorded here, the only thing we know about him is that he was a leader in the Jerusalem church, uh, meeting with the council. He had the gift of prophecy. And uh, beyond that, we know absolutely nothing about him. Uh, he's not mentioned again in the uh, New Testament. There is a Joseph with a similar name in Acts chapter 1. Uh, he was actually the individual, this is for trivia buffs, the individual who ran against Matthias to replace Judas, and uh, he lost. Uh, some say, well, maybe that was the same one, but the names are different, and there's no connection between uh, the two of them in uh, Scripture at all in the book of Acts. So we don't know anything about him, but fortunately, God does keep the record of his servants. The second one who went with the letter uh, was Silas. And of course, we know him because he became uh, Paul's partner on the second uh, missionary journey. And uh, by the way, the one who later carried the uh, letters from Peter to the churches uh, out there. The letter itself spelled out everything that had been said, reinforced it. Uh, one key phrase in that letter that I, I think we should make note of, in verse 28, it says, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. The early church relied, as Dan has mentioned, on the Old Testament, on the words of Jesus, and then they were very dependent on the Holy Spirit to give them direction. Um, I think too often uh, we make decisions in churches based on, yeah, this is the way we feel, rather than seeking out the Holy Spirit and, and his wisdom. In verses 15 to 35, uh, we have the record of them receiving that letter. And uh, it was received, it says, with great joy. It was a real blessing to the Gentiles to know uh, that they really were Christians. Mm -hmm. Some of them were questioning that. And that he didn't have to go through Judaism to do it. Uh, it offered the Gentiles a freedom in Christ that they did not have there. Just for information only, if you have a King James Bible, there's a, a verse that's omitted in the NIV. And uh, that simply says that Silas remained in Antioch. It's not in the best early uh, scriptures, and so it's left out probably designed to say that's where he was when Paul wanted to get him. I suspect Paul had to send a whatever letter to Jerusalem and saying, hey, come on back over. Let's do something together. That's the council of Jerusalem. That's Paul or Peter in Acts. Now we pick him up in the book he wrote, First Peter. Dan? Yeah, because after after this point in the book of Acts, the Luke changes focus and and focuses is in, focuses in on on Paul and his ministry as he does his missionary journeys and things like that, and and Peter just kind of disappears from the book of Acts, and so at, at this point we are going to um, finally. <laughs> Turn to Peter's letters, Peter's writings, and uh, we'll give you some, hopefully a little bit of background today on, um, on Peter's writings and who, they're, who we think they're to and what they're all about, things like that. We'll actually get into the book of Peter uh, later, but uh, we do want to give you some, some background information. Um, <clears throat> and... Uh, I, I, there is there is a mention of of Peter uh, other than the book of Acts. Um, there is uh, we know that Peter spent some time in Antioch, uh, according to Galatians chapter two, and there's a, a reference to Peter in First Corinthians chapter one, um, where um, it talks about him maybe having visited uh, Corinth as well, and First uh, Corinthians chapter nine. Um, some some people were complaining, and, uh, and uh, they asked about traveling with their wives and with their families. And, and uh, someone asks, don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do the other apostles and the Lord's brother and Cephas? And so Peter's mentioned there as well that he's been traveling and his, his wife is, is coming with him. 
Um, and, and it shows that he's engaged in missionary travel just like, just like Paul is. But for whatever reason, Luke has, in the book of Acts, has focused in on Paul's ministry. We don't have a, a record of, of Peter's travels or anything like that. It's not, not really known where he went and how, who he spoke to and things like that. Um, the, where was Peter when he wrote First Peter? Well, we're not exactly sure. Um, because it's kind of cryptic. Um, at the very end of First Peter, and, and we remember that a, a lot of times, as was typical in letters of the time, at the end of the letter, you would bring greetings from everyone that was around you. Well, at the very end of, of First Peter, First Peter 5, verse 13, uh, Peter says uh, something very cryptic. He says, uh, she who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings. Um, and, and that has caused a little bit of consternation. What does Peter mean when he talks about Babylon? Um <laughs> And, and the problem is we, we don't exactly 100% know. Uh, it is possible that Peter was actually living and talking in, in Babylon, Babylon um, of, of Babylonian fame, I guess. Um, Babylon was not the power that it had been 300, 400 years before with Nebuchadnezzar and, and, and Daniel and the lion's den and some of those uh, people that we talked about in our previous um, uh, Bible studies, uh, but it was still a, a an important city, and and there was a significant Jewish population in that uh, in that area during Peter's day. Um, probably a, a few people that had fled from Rome under the the persecution of of, of Claudius and Caligula. Uh, it seems that they maybe had traveled to uh, Babylon. There was also a, a fairly large group of people that had been taken captive during the Babylonian captivity 300 years before. And then when given the opportunity to return back to Jerusalem and Judea, uh, chose not to. And Daniel seems to be one of those people that uh, other people went back to, to Israel and he chose to stay in Babylon. And so there's probably some people, uh, some Jewish people living, uh, living there as well um, in Babylon. And so there, there, there is the possibility that he was actually in uh, the city of Babylon. Um, and, and some have also suggested, and we'll talk about this when I, when I show you my slides in just a minute, um, my, the map, um, that when Peter talks about um, who he's sending the, the, the letter to, he kind of gives a list of countries from, from east to west. And so if he was living in Babylon in the east, then that would be the order that uh, that they would have received the letter. And so some have suggested that it's actually that he's actually living in Babylon. Um, a second option, which is I, I think pretty much been been put aside, but I just thought I'd mention it real quick. There happens to be another Babylon uh, in Egypt uh, on the Nile River. And a few have suggested that maybe Peter was down there. Uh, that, that particular Babylon in, in Egypt was, was kind of a small Roman military post. And most people nowadays are like, nah, that's, there's no reason for Peter to be down there. Uh, it's highly unlikely anyways. Um, and, and particularly if he had Silas and, and, uh, and, and John Mark with him as well. So that one's pretty much uh, been thrown out by now. Uh, I, I think, and this seems to be the, the best possible uh, solution, is that Peter's use of the word uh, Babylon is, is a code. Um, it's a cryptic name used in the early church to identify Rome. Um, the title was given to Rome because uh, of its sinfulness of the city, 
um, and its commitment to many idols, very much like Babylon had been. Uh, with all the persecution going on, you, you, unlike here in the United States where we are uh, allowed to criticize our government, um, and in, in ancient Rome, you were not allowed to criticize the government. And, uh, and so if you were saying things about uh, Rome and you didn't want the Roman government to get down on you, you'd say, oh, yeah, the people in Babylon, wink, 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 you know, <laughs> yeah, you know who we're talking about, uh, send their greetings. Uh, and so, and it wasn't unusual for people to, uh, to talk about that. It, it does uh, seem that... Um, in in both in the book of Revelation, um, John is writing, and he also mentions Babylon as a as a code for for the Roman government and the Roman authorities. Uh, so it seemed to be fairly common. Uh, an additional reason many feel that Peter was writing from Rome itself is that it's about this time that that Paul is is in Rome himself, uh, and he wrote to uh, Timothy. And uh, and we talk about and and in in Second uh, Timothy chapter four, Paul says uh, he wants John Mark to join him, and uh, Mark was one of the the people that was with Peter, and so um, it could be that uh, Peter and and Paul were both in Rome, and and uh, Paul says, hey, uh, have have Mark come to see me. And he just had to cross the cross the the, the city, um, <laughs> if if Peter's in Rome, it, the it, it makes for a great, good discussion. But to be completely honest, knowing where uh, people where where Peter was when he wrote his letter may help us to understand the background and some of the challenges to the early church. But in the end, it's it's the most important issue is, is what we do with the message that Peter sends, not necessarily where he sent it from. When did he write it? Well, I think probably the best guess is he wrote it about uh, A.D. 64, which would be about 30 years after the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, persecution was beginning at that time and uh, they were beginning to feel the pressure on it. Nero was the emperor. Uh, he was definitely anti-Christian and so forth. Right after that, a couple of years after that is when uh, Nero uh, burned Rome, fiddled while it burned, and then he blamed the Christians for it. Uh, and uh, if Paul, Peter had written after that, uh, he probably would have made specific reference to Christians being put to death because that was rampant after uh, Rome burned. The fact that he simply talks about persecution and uh, not being martyred uh, would indicate that he probably wrote it just before that broke out. Perhaps uh, under the inspiration of God, uh, perhaps simply reading the signs of the times, he knew uh, that it was going to get difficult. The letter itself, I think, is a tremendously important letter, uh, particularly for the church in our generation. Uh, Peter wrote to churches that were being, I'm going to say, mildly persecuted, probably a little more than that. But they were going to face even more in the immediate future. And uh, Peter's concern was that the believers remain strong in the Lord uh, when facing what was, as far as they were concerned, unjust suffering. Uh, there are many, many passages uh, in Peter, and we'll look at them as we go through, that speak of persecution. And Peter wanted the people to remain faithful even in those difficult times. And his basic reasoning is God knows what the ultimate end is and uh, he's in control. And I can assure you that uh, if you're faithful, you're gonna receive the full blessing of salvation that, that's been promised in Jesus. Interestingly, some of the commentators on uh, First Peter, 
uh, talk about Peter uh, as being the, uh, well, the first Peter as being the Job of the New Testament, presenting a challenge to Christians to remain faithful even when they, like Job, uh, are being persecuted for righteousness sake. Uh, I think that becomes tremendously important in, in our day. Uh, we're well aware, we look at it in our churches, the, the persecuted church, we, we hear the reports. Certainly there are many, many people around the world who are persecuted severely uh, every week because they choose to worship the Lord. They're paying a heavy price for their faith. Paul wanted, or Peter wanted his readers and us to know uh, that if you keep the big picture, you're willing to face that kind of thing. This letter is all about the, the hope we f have in the Lord, the assurance of it. First Peter 1.17, in a sense, summarizes Peter's message. And it reads, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. You're going to be here. It's not going to be easy, but stay close to the Lord. His message is, and we'll see this over and again, uh, this world is not ultimately our home. And uh, Peter will describe them, and we'll look at this next week, uh, Christians as aliens and strangers in the world. Uh, Paul picked up on that same idea and talked about uh, our citizenship not being here but in heaven. So who was... Um the books the first peter written to um in many ways we want to remember that first peter is god's message to us of course it's in the bible it's you know, profitable for teaching and, and all those things um but but it would help us to understand the situations if we understand who the first recipients are of that and in a typical fashion of letters in that day and age um, the ones who are being written to are almost always identified at the very beginning of the letter. And, and that's the case um, here. First Peter chapter 1, verse 1 says uh, to uh, Peter, he identifies himself, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, uh, to God's elect exiles or strangers in the world scattered through Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And I have a map. By the way, this is Nero when he was uh, a young child, so uh, before he became emperor. Um, so here's, here's a map of, of Greece and Asia Minor. Uh, Asia Minor is, is modern-day uh, Turkey. And you can see there, uh, starting... Um, from the from the right hand side, uh, Pontus, uh, Galatia, um, Cappadocia, right below it. Uh, Asia would be all of those smaller um, countries or, or districts: uh, Phrygia, Lyconia, Pisidia, um, Pamphylia, Lydia, Mysia. Those are all considered Asia Minor, and then uh, or Asia, and then ending up with uh, Bithynia. And, and so basically, Peter is sending this to the churches in, in modern day Turkey. All of these churches, um, uh, sorry, the order in which they are named is probably uh, the reflects the, the route that Silas is going to take as he transports this letter around. Um, he's going to go and, and, and stop at all of these places and move from, from east to west. And we don't know for certain how the gospel spread to some of these regions. Um, we know that Paul did some missionary journey in the, the southern half of that, uh, Cilicia, Pamphylia, uh, Lydia, places like that, um, across the Aegean Sea into Macedonia and Achaia. Um, but, uh, but we don't have Paul going into those northern regions. Uh, of of modern day Turkey, and it, so it's possible that uh, there's some uh, some of the Jews from that region were, were present on the day of Pentecost uh, that we talked about earlier on. It had gone back. Um, uh, it could be that Peter or other missionaries had traveled through that point, um, and, and so Peter is sending this letter to them. Um, 
what we really don't know is is who made up those churches, whether the churches were primarily Jewish or, or primarily Gentile Christians. Um, there and and uh, this biblical scholarship is kind of split down the middle. Was was First Peter written to Jewish Christians or Gentile Christians? Um, because the problem is that um, there are there are phrases in First Peter that kind of go with both. In, in favor of First Peter being written to Jews, um, we do know that many of the cities in Asia Minor had large Jewish communities. And, and Peter refers to them in, um, in 1 Peter 1.1 1, 1 as being scattered. And that, that phrase, that term scattered, uh, often it, it talks about the, the, the diaspora, the, the Jewish people that were scattered around the world. Um, and it's a really technical term um, that, that talks about Jews who live in foreign lands away from Israel. Uh, Peter also uses additional Jewish terms and various um, uh, allusions and, and quotes from the Old Testament uh, in his in his book, and so and, and those those Old Testament quotes would most easily be understood by a Jewish audience, uh, particularly First uh, Peter uh, two nine, where uh, he says, you know, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood a holy nation, God's special possession. Those, those are all uh, phrases that dis discuss the Jewish people and their relationship with God. Um, he refers to sprinkling of the blood, which comes out of the book of Numbers and, and things like that. And so a lot of people, uh, a lot of biblical scholars think that he was writing to primarily Jewish um, uh, Christians. However, there is a group that also thinks that uh, it might have been written to the Gentile Christians because there are also in the book of Peter uh, phrases that would not likely be used when referencing Jewish Christians. First Peter 1.4, um, he talks about uh, the people that are receiving this have been living in ignorance. And that was a phrase that... that not the ignorance part, but that phrase in in was was oftentimes used by by Jews um, criticizing Gentiles. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't understand who God is, and so and so it's it's uh, that's it's more of a um, if he's calling them ignorant, he's basically saying. He's not saying they don't know. He's just saying you're 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 Gentiles and you don't quite understand. Let me explain. Um, in First Peter one eight, he writes that the recipients had inherited a futile way of life handed down by their forefathers. Well, that's to to a Jewish person that that's not a futile life. But if you were Jewish and you were talking to Gentiles, yeah, the Gentile way of life, the Roman way of thinking, was was futile. Uh, not some, not not what you would respond, uh, refer to a Jew, who whose heritage was the Old Testament, um, and and in First Peter two ten he talks about them not being a people. Well, the Jewish, the Jewish Jewish people consider themselves a a people, and so when he says you're not a people, he's probably referring to non non Jews. Um, and, and that's what I, that's what I think. I think he was he was referring mostly to non-Jews. Uh, the the fact that Peter may have written this letter primarily to primarily to Gentiles is interesting. Is that because Peter is almost always known as a, a missionary to the to the Jews? But we've already seen he did have a ministry to Gentiles to Cornelius and and to people like that. Um, so, so we could, uh, we don't know for sure, um, but again, uh, it, it will help us with some background to make some guesses, but really the message it's, that's important there. In your handout, which if you um, will get from Dad's church this coming week, if you want, uh, I emailed some of you from my church, and uh, it's on the church website as well. Uh, there are some key themes that are found in the book of First Peter. Um, uh, 
people who suffer for as Christians will be proven faithful and exalted when Christ returns. The church is a new temple, a new Israel, a new people of God. Um, and so all, all people who are Christians are part of God's family. Um, believers should set their hope on their end time inheritance, that Christ died as a substitute for sinners, uh, and his death is the basis for life. Uh, there's there's a list of them there in the handout. You can look at them. I do want to uh, point out there's also a, a quote from Warren Worsby on your handout, but I want to read that quote because I think it's pretty interesting. It says, there can be no... Um, uh, here, here's what Warren Risby says. At least 15, time, 15 times in this letter, Peter referred to suffering, and he used eight different Greek words to do so. Some of these Christians were suffering because they, they were living godly lives and doing what was good and right. Others were suffering reproach for the name of Christ and, and being railed at by unsaved people. Peter wrote to encourage them to be good witnesses to their persecutors and to remember that their suffering would lead to glory. And I, so I think that's the, the, the kind of the theme that we're going to look at starting next week. The, the primary issue in 1 Peter is how a Christian should handle suffering. And, and Peter's answer, to, to give the book away, uh, Peter's answer in general is we, we focus on Jesus, what he's done for us and what awaits for us. And, um, and that's, that's what we do as we as we submit to God in his will. Um, it is now 757, so we just have a little bit of time. If uh, there are any questions or comments, uh, let me allow you to unmute yourselves. And uh, whoops, uh, stop sharing. <laughs> the wrong button there. Uh, if you have any questions or comments before we close in a word of prayer, um, now would be a good time to, to do that. Just as a just as a suggestion, <laughs> it'll take you probably 20 minutes. Read through First Peter uh, from start to finish as a letter. Uh, we, we look at it piecemeal because that's the only way we can do it. But if you got a letter from somebody, you don't read the first paragraph and wait a week and read the second paragraph. <laughs> read it through, start to finish, and then focus on the first few verses of First Peter 1, which we'll look at next week. Any questions, comments, thoughts? And you had said about uh, possibly... Uh, James and Jesus had a higher education. Could uh, have, yeah. But uh, I'm I'm thinking about uh, Joseph was was a carpenter who, who was a craftsman. So so he probably was on a much higher level than like a shepherd or whatever, you know. So I'm thinking it because you were saying possibly that they that that. Paid right. for the education for James and for Jesus. The the interesting thing um, in 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 the language that's used when it talks about Joseph being a carpenter, we're we're not exactly sure what that word carpenter actually means um, in in the the Hebrew Greek. Does it does it mean someone that works with wood? Um, some have suggested that that word might mean like more of a stonemason, um, which takes a lot of math to get a building to stand upright. And, and so he might have been you know, quite smart. Uh, I, I know if someone asked me to um, put new cabinets in, my, in, in the kitchen in my house, I'd be like, oh, no, I, can, I can't do it. Uh, so he had to have some kind of smarts. Um, there is uh, near near Nazareth um, during the time that Jesus was growing up. There was a city that was being built by the Romans, and uh, there's been suggested that maybe uh, Joseph worked. At, uh, I, I want to say Sepphoris, I, but don't quote me on that. I better eliminate that from the video in case it's wrong. But there's a city that uh, that was being built uh, to be Roman's city, and some have suggested that uh, that 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 Joseph 
uh, was might have been a, a, a master carpenter, a master stonemason, a master builder um, in that city and, and had the opportunity to not stay with the rest of the workers outside the city, but he had the opportunity to go back home um, as Jesus was growing up and spend time there, which, which would have put him on a little bit higher plane and kind of adds to the idea that, it, that maybe James and Jesus got a little bit better education than, than the, the shepherds and the fishermen and then people like that. Okay. Um, I, Jesus I, is I mentioned as, just... as, a, as a, a rabbi. And some have said, well, we, we don't have any record of him going to rabbinical school. Well, yeah, but arguing from science, from silence is oftentimes not a good thing. We don't know. Maybe he did go to some rabbinical school. We don't, we don't know. The, uh, we, we get the idea of him not being well-educated from the experience of the other disciples that he taught and uh, from the attitude of the Pharisees towards him uneducated and so forth. I guess I would have to ask the question, if I were Joseph and Mary, and I had been told that my son was going to be the Messiah, the King, and so forth, would I not want to make sure he got the best possible education? Yeah. Um, I don't know. The best it possible doesn't education matter. he could afford. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It doesn't matter. I don't know that... Uh, you know, it's a big deal, only it does help us to sometimes rethink what we kind of have as traditional views of, of Jesus and so forth. Well, wasn't he also at 12 years of age at the temple teaching the leaders? <laughs> yeah. They were amazed at his, at his understanding. When I was 12, I wasn't teaching any leaders. So. <laughs> well, you're not... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, <that's true. laughs> Artie, I'm sure you amazed your teachers though. Yeah. I'm sure, but yeah. I'm not sure which way. <laughs> yeah, they were amazed at how poorly I was doing, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> Every midterm we got Dan's grades from RVA. <laughs> and we would sit down with him and discuss which ones were really good and which ones needed work. So by the end of the term, uh, the ones that needed work, he worked on at the expense of the others. So they kind of <laughs> flipped. <laughs> it works. Upside down world. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dan, I got time for... Yeah, yeah why, a word of prayer. why don't I close with prayer and then uh, then we can we can get out of here for the week. So uh, let's let's have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for uh, this evening, the opportunity we have to come together in our various homes and learn more about you and learn more about uh, Peter and his life and his devotion to you. And as we begin to look at his letters and we see some of the parallels in persecution that are going on now, uh, not to the extent that uh, the, the early Christians felt, but to, we see that's coming. We just ask that we will remain focused on you, that we will remember that um, this world is not our home, um, and we long and look forward to a time when we can be uh, with you in heaven. And we ask you to be with us this evening and the various other activities that are going to be going on. Um, we ask you to uh, provide and protect us. We ask all this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Hi, Ardella. Didn't get to say hi to you.